Now, before we get into today's episode, I just want to preface it by saying that this is the lost episode, the final episode that was recorded but never released before I took a long break from the podcast. So some of the things that Mike talks about that he has going on are a little bit different now, but the whole rest of the conversation is still relevant uh, to everything that's going on today. And we talk a lot about the future of, of where we see art education going. So I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Welcome back. It is Wednesday and it's time once again for the Pencil Kings podcast. Today we are talking again with Mike Matezzi. Did I say that right, Mike? I had it wrong yeah, the first time, but I feel like you got it right this time. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Thanks. And if if you didn't catch the first episode that we or the first interview that we had with Mike, we're talking a lot about drawing his main book. He's got several books, but the main one is Drawing with Force and how that's different and how I was so excited by the passion that you have. And there, like you have a way of sitting down and doing live drawing studies that I had, you know, even though I'd done many, many hours of this, I, it had never occurred to me to look at it the way that you do. And, and I, I remember the quote was something like, you feel that the, the, the model is having such an amazing experience and you, as the humble artist, can only hope to capture maybe like a fraction of the energy and the amazing feeling that's happening in the room. And I, I had always thought of it as the other way, just like the model's there for my amusement. I'm the artist. I'm the one in control. And so it was like it was right. a paradigm shift. And, it, and yeah, I was really thankful for that conversation. So welcome back. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And so I, I can't remember how long it's been, but how mm. are you doing today? What are you excited about today? Um, God, there's so many, a lot of different things. Um, first of all, uh, you know, I've been more focused on drawingforce.com now over the last uh, year. And, uh, you know, as we were just speaking prior, um, there's a lot of changes I'm making there as well. I'm going to be doing many more like live demonstrations and recorded demonstrations on our site and adding way more like photography content for the artists there and something that we launched maybe about five months ago was a, a forum finally on our website I, I used to have one probably over a decade ago <laughs> that i tore down because it finally got like spammed to death and broken into so now there's finally a new forum on a brand new drawingforce.com and um, we're really trying to grow the um, participation there so we have all these different types of challenges that we drive over there that's um really keeping um our uh, members interested, you know, and uh, invigorated, I think, with the site, you know, and, and we're always, it, there's me and there's two other instructors on the website that teach force. Um, one artist named Swen Lee and the other guy is uh, Diego, and they're both really also obviously amazing at um, my method of drawing. So they're, you know, helping people learn um, how to, you know, how to draw with force. Um, so that's probably one of the main, I would say that's like the main stuff that I'm interested in right now, what I'm excited by. I started, um, I just started teaching more like locally again. I'm in the Bay Area. So um, it's been interesting to return to the classroom, you know, to like the physical classroom. Um, in fact, yesterday I was at the Academy of Art um, in San Francisco and I've been um, hosting here and there at CCA, uh, which are the two bigger like art schools here in San Francisco. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to see always what the sort of benefits are of being in the real world space with a student and what the benefits are of being online, you know, and looking at those two and seeing, uh, you know, how, I guess, how much can those two worlds really merge and where are the final walls of where, you know what, this will just never happen unless, I don't know, unless, you know, we start bringing VR or something into uh, this space, you know, which nobody's done yet. It's something to think about, you know, <laughs> I don't know where that can go, but, you know, like I said, there's certain things you get out of being in the real world, you know, room that are really tough, I think, to pull off, um, online, but, you know, l look at online, right? Like online, you know, as, as I'm sure you have as well, we have students from all over the world, right? And I never would have had any communication with most of the people that I talk to now, if it wasn't for the internet and being able to teach on the internet. In fact, I would say I, I held off on trying to teach force online for also probably over a decade. Like it was starting to happen on, online and I kept holding off and holding off because I'm like, I don't, you know, I'm, I really come from teaching in a classroom. <clears throat> and I was like, I just don't see how this is going to work. You know, how is it possible? <clears throat> Until finally, um, without mentioning names, an animation school had hired me to um, to teach my force class at their school online. And I was like, 
okay, you know, someone's willing to pay me to do it. And here I'm going to be able to test if it really works or not, right? Without me testing it on my own, on my own website. Uh, let's see what, what happens. And, uh, and I was like, damn, I can't believe this actually is working. <laughs> you know, that people can actually understand, um, my method, uh, without being in a physical room, you know, with a physical model, you know, I think the thing you lose probably more than anything is just space, meaning, you know, depth and such, right? Like what's most frustrating to me with teaching online is no matter what people are mostly looking at photographs of models or even, even looking at like a video turnaround is not the same as sitting in a room with a live human being, you know, like, I, I just don't know when that, that, that might be a hundred years from now. I, I don't know when that's going to happen, but other than that, um, you know, online has been working way better than I probably ever could have anticipated, you know. That's actually a really interesting thing that you brought up about where this is all going and in, in kind of the shortcomings of online. I wonder if this is something where a cheap – one of those cheap headsets where you basically mm -hmm. throw your smartphone into it, but instead of – it being, I've seen one where somebody had a slideshow where they were, or sort of like a slideshow where they were walking, they went on vacation and they were showing me like, here's where I was in India in, in the market. And they're kind of walking through and it was, it was cool. I could, you know, tilt my head up and see the sky and I could look left and right. But what if there was a 3D model? Like, I feel like, cause, be, uh, you know, scanning is so easy now. There might even be some app out there that can use your phone to create like a photogrammetry 3D model or something. And you put that so the student sitting in their chair could still kind of like tilt their head and lean to the side and get more of a sense of depth for what they were looking at, just like yeah. if they were sitting in a live studio session. Because, yeah, you can get up and walk around the model and look at the other side. But, I mean, you're, you're just drawing what's on your paper. So you're usually you're not moving around a ton as the, as the artist, right. or at least – I, I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't gone through uh, force drawing myself, but right, right. No, it's true. Most of the time, to your point, you're in one place, and not to not to tangent this conversation, but the irony for me there always is. <laughs> this happened just yesterday when I was in San Francisco, and you know sometimes you get a, a angle of the model that's really really difficult or unappealing or whatever, right? And it's like, hey, nobody's stopping you from getting up and moving to the other side of the room. By the way, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. So, but to your point with the VR thing, uh, yeah, maybe it is, you know, maybe it's something to look at. You and I could start another business and, <laughs> you know. Well, no, I, I, I'm like, more for like, let, let's get the community. Let's get somebody else making some money. Here's an idea. You know, someone who's listening, this is yeah. a, this is a real idea. Like if you yeah, went and, and no, there, you could go through the list of this, you know, guests on this podcast, you could go to all the other podcasts, find all these instructors and say, hey, I've got a way that your students can do more realistic life drawing. Uh, it only costs you X, and it's yep. the next ev evolution of stock photography. It's the yeah. next evolution of those model packs, which people have been selling for years. No, yeah, it's true. And I, I think it. My gut is it would definitely benefit. You know, um, it would bring us one step closer to reality again. You know, that that's like I said. If there's one thing really missing between the real world right now and drawing online or through a website is the reality of space, you know, because we're all looking at two-dimensional screens, you know. Another version, which, you know, would be AR, right? Like, imagine if, even if you had a mini version of the model, which maybe is a few feet tall versus, you know, full life, you know, full real life, you know, height, uh, maybe like half, let's say, or, or a third, almost like a maquette, <laughs> right, of the model, and you could see that, you know, that would help too, right? And you can actually rotate it. That would be a great way of, of making a, a jump also. So this, I think there'd be a bunch of options in that space. It is a kind of interesting idea to take a look at, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's out there. I've, I've, I want, you know, the, I've been struggling with this podcast because I want more people to be taking action and doing cool stuff and right. just right. say, I don't want any credit. I just want people to do stuff, but I want to hear about it. I want to hear that, Hey, yeah. this new thing is happening, and uh, I want the you know the whole art education space to get continue to get better. I think we're at a place now where it's easy for anybody to jump in and start teaching. Really, all that you need is to build an audience of people that like your stuff. I've, yeah. I've like everyone has their opinion who is a good or who is a bad artist or who is a good or who is a bad instructor. But to be sure. honest, it does not matter from the standpoint of like just doing something. Um, if somebody yeah. likes the the drawings that you do of, um, I don't know, rare bacteria, 
and they want to learn from you how to be become a, an artist of rare bacteria. You can build like a little business out of this, and so uh, you know, just do do something cool. The the thing that I want to talk about here, though, Mike, is so you've been working a lot on your website. Now you're teaching in the school. You you saw that there's like a lack of depth, but what other what other things have you learned, or or what other things are you seeing um, where students are maybe having success in this sort of new kind of virtual online format um, that other people who are who are studying or listening could use to improve their art? And you know, for me, the big thing is you, you have to be taking action. There's way too many people listening to stuff like this or just watching videos on YouTube, but not doing anything with it. I think that's the, the biggest thing. And I, I don't think, I'm not sure if that existed so much in the past. Like when I was growing up pre internet days, if you like drawing, you drew, you (laughs) you didn't watch videos of other people drawing to kind of live vicariously through what they're doing. You, you did the thing that you wanted to do. Um, so that aside, what what other things are you seeing where people are having success, and what are you trying? Like you mentioned, um, you're trying to do challenges and, and um, to get people going. But what other things um, could we tell or talk about that might be helpful for people listening to help them have a better educational experience? Yeah, I would almost I would start the conversation with the opposite, which is like what doesn't work here, you know? And I, I think what's sort of um, I don't know, sort of really hidden is the idea that uh, you can just sit and watch content and learn because that's not really how becoming an artist works, right? It it takes some effort and uh, experience, right? It takes physical and mental experience to actually improve. And uh, it's really easy to go through a, um, a website like yours or mine and look at content and feel like you're learning. But if you don't actually do the work, you're not learning, you know, like on my website, you know, when you sign on, one of the first emails you get from the site is this isn't Netflix, you know, like you can't binge watch like the 400 plus videos on the site. You're you'll you'll think you're learning because you've watched the videos intellectually. But if you haven't actually taken action, all of a sudden when you sit down to go and draw, you're still going to be where you were at. It doesn't matter if you think you got it with your mind. Right. Like you have to be actually able to do it with your with your hands. So. One of the struggles to get now to your question is, you know, one of the struggles I've had is exactly that, you know, like my site gives um, members access to all the videos, you know, and I've really debated um, for years now, uh, even now with the new site, do I, you know, do I sort of um, unlock content based on results of the students, more like a class, right, but not a class because it's still just the videos, you know, and uh, I did a survey actually just recently and like that, um, that option did very poorly. People were like, no, don't lock the content. (laughs) (laughs) I like, I want, you know, and and I think the one that won, you know, one was like, don't lock the content. The other one was, you know, lock, um, well, one was lock the content. The other one was don't lock it, leave it open how it is. And the other, the last one was sort of a soft combination of the two. Right. And I think that's the one I'm moving forward with, which is I'm going to give you um, sort of a test or an assessment at the end of every section of my site that you can take, and it's not going to unlock content because the rest is still there, but at least it'll give you some tools to assess, like, where am I really at? Should I move on or should I not move on? You know, so I'm trying to give them a a self-awareness moment of, you know, am I really ready to move on to the next phase of the content right now or not, you know, versus the unlocking piece. So... Um, I don't know. I think that that's the biggest challenge is, uh, well, number one is like self-motivation, right? Like, am I motivated to do it? When you go to an art school, you know, it's like, what's motivating you? Well, for me, I know one thing was my parents are paying for my education. Like that, for me, that was actually one of the biggest ones. I was like, there's no way I'm not going to succeed here when my parents were willing to invest in me, right? Uh, for some kids that really works for some others, they don't care who's paying, you know, like that doesn't motivate them anymore or any less. Mm-hmm. And the second one was once I actually started getting better in my sophomore year, then I was self-motivated by sophomore year. I was like, oh, I'm actually getting better. I can see my, oh, improvement. maybe I, I, this might be the thing yeah. that you, that people need to get to a level where there's, it's like now you can own the journey. Somebody else right. had to get you started. Right. And maybe that's the thing where, uh, 
the locking and unlocking the content. It's sort of like, you need to do these steps and show me that you've got it. Then I'll unlock everything for you. So right. you and, and maybe they can even free flow a little bit because I feel like our natural inclination is to want to free flow to be to want everything. I want all of net all of the Netflix. You know, I right. I don't right. want to have to watch the the top ten movies of all time before I can get to the rest of the the, the content. But right. I, I think it's it's not a fair comparison because Netflix is just it's one way. It's it's entertainment. You're just consuming. Right. Right. But this but education is two way or. And yep. that's where it really happens is when you put in your half, that's the other part of the, the, the agreement. And, hmm. Yeah, it's this, you know, um, another, you know, another friend of mine who has another site, you know, he, the term he was using, which really kind of stuck with me, was accountability, right? It's like the accountability of the artist to say, you know, I'm accountable here for me really trying to improve myself on, on the work, you know, and. When I have, you know, when I have, when you have a class, when I teach a class on force versus just having an uh, an open library of videos, um, that immediately changes things, right? Then I think just the structure, even calling something a class, um, brings to people's um, minds a different structure, right? You think, oh, this is a class. I'm going to go once a week. You know, I'm, I have to be, I'm accountable now, right, for this work because this teacher is going to look at the work every week, which is also, I think, why physical schools, that's one thing that really works for them. And, you know, it doesn't have to be physical, right? There's there's plenty of online schools that teach classes. And, and you know, if you have a teacher and you've got the schedule going, you feel like you're, uh, you know, you have a responsibility to the instructor as well to, like, get the stuff done, not just yourself, right? And, and there's other students in the class. So some students might be embarrassed by the act that like, oh, uh, you know, I can't, I keep coming in week after week and I don't have my homework, right? There's something about the culture of a community versus an individual sitting at home on their own um, watching videos, right? It, it's a, you just, same with you and I, right? Like it'd be really easy where we're running our own sites to go, you know what, this week, I just want to play video games, <laughs> you know? I don't want to work on the site, but you know, as an entrepreneur, typically those are not the, those types of people are not like that. You know, we're like, what's the next thing? How do I improve it? How do I make this better for, for the people that are interested in what I'm teaching? You know, that's like, for me, at least that's what drives me like day in and day out, day in and day out is how do I make this better? How do I make this better? You know, mm -hmm. but it'd be really easy to, to not, you know, I'm kind of aware of the other, the, the, the other side, the dark side of, you know what? I could just shut down this week. Like the site's going to run. Everything's going, you know, the, the forum will be there. The videos are there and I can just like take a break, you know? Um, and I think when you're home and you're signed on to my site or your site or any other site for that matter, where you're trying to learn, um, it's easy to back out, right? There's no, uh, I don't know. I guess there's no external pressure to create internal pressure of saying I'm, I'm motivated. I'm going to keep doing this. And then, you know, at the risk of me saying this, but I'm going to put it out there. Um, the other sort of stigma that's occurred over the last few years is the concept of millennials, you know, and like, who are they and what does it mean to be a millennial? I mean, there's videos that are literally like gag videos over like, what's a millennial, you know? And ironically, the schools I have talked to here locally, um, have both said to me without them even knowing I'm talking to either one of them have said, yeah, we've had this real challenge over the last like few years, just recently, with really having students that are like motivated to work, you know? So I think there's a, there's sort of a bigger thing going on, you know, out there as well, um, which is parents having taught, you know, or brought up children in a certain manner, which then get older and are not necessarily motivated to really, you know, learn and push, right. To push hard. And, uh, you know, and I'm not saying that's, I don't know if that's good or bad. I'm not trying to judge that. All I'm saying is that's that's what I've been hearing, right? So it's like all this stuff comes down to like self-motivation, right? It's like you and I can do only so much to, I think, uh, inspire and excite people to to want to improve. Um, like what does it take for the audience as well to realize like I, I want to grow? And I think kind of the thing you grabbed onto before is uh, – for me, what happened was change, right? Like my mat, my biggest motivation was seeing that effort I was putting in was coming back, right? Like I was changing, I was growing and learning and improving. And I, I think to me, if you can have someone in your uh, membership um, feel that 
then that's going to want them to keep learning, right? And isn't that one of the major reasons we're all on this planet, <laughs> right? Is to like learn and improve and, and grow, right? Not to just stand still, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's, I don't know, I guess that's, that's probably the hardest part, right? It's just having someone actually, A, take the step to, um, they have to take the step to actually make change occur. But I think once they feel it or see it, then they'll want to do it. You know, like I mentor as well online through my website. And I think that's, those are the relationships that are the tightest because I, I speak to people one-on-one -on -one for an hour, you know, through the internet. Um, but it's almost like an individual class, right? And those people I think really feel it more than anyone because they see the growth and I'm, and they're like responsible, right? They're more responsible because, I'm on a calendar with them, you know, and they're going to meet me next Sunday and there's assignments, <laughs> you know, and I think it's a kind of human nature that you sometimes need another person that you feel responsible to, to some degree, to really try to help drive you forward. Right. I mean, it's, it's like having a physical trainer, right. It's the same idea, you know, or a coach, like you've always got this other person that is helping like drive you forward. You know, it's tough to be self-motivated with no accountability to, to, to anyone. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's the challenge we're up against, right? What are your thoughts on that? No, I, th I think definitely if you can get somebody past that, past that moment where they can start to own the journey, but then also having someone that they feel accountable. I, and it, it might even be that as educators, we, we take a lot of things for granted in the offline world that mm -hmm don't necessarily translate into the online world. For example, uh, I know a lot of people who have businesses that run primarily on word of mouth. Right. Um, online isn't so different. Like social media, you could say is word of mouth, but it also, it, it is kind of different. You know, it doesn't just happen kind of serendipitously because you grew up with people in high school and they know, know you because you lived in the same place forever. And right. um, so it's bigger world too, right? Like, yeah, it, it's a bigger world. And I think too, that as educators, we fall into the trap of, of saying like, okay, we're, we're going to teach this method online, but you, we're not able to properly assess the students when they come in and we end up treating everyone almost the same yeah, that's where true. there's some people who are really hardcore. Uh, there's some people who might be better artists in, in whatever they, they, they focus on than, than you and I, and they're coming to our sites to learn a specific thing and we treat them like a beginner. And, and so it's hard to know where all these people are coming from. And, you know, some people are, have different languages or, uh, different special needs, uh, that we're just not considering. And so I feel like for us as educators, there's a long way to go because it's kind of like anything is a possibility now. And the answer may just be to do less. Um, or, or at least that's the conclusion that I'm starting to come to that there are, it, it used to be come to pencil Kings. It's, it's for everyone. And now it's come to pencil Kings. We help beginners have breakthrough moments, like these breakthrough moments that we were just talking about right. where people, if things start to click and now they can start to own their own journey because this is, this is something that we've realized. Right. Um, but yeah, saying, you know, we're here for everyone is just, well, how, you're not, you know, you, you, you can't do that. And it's the equivalent of going to the restaurant where there's 200 items on the menu and right. you're like, what's good here? Yeah. <laughs> you just, there's no answer. Or you go to a restaurant and it's like, we have three burgers. They're all awesome. Uh, if you're super hungry and you like spicy, get burger three. And, and yeah, no, that's true. way more, way more concise. And I feel like that model has a lot like maybe it doesn't scale infinitely. Right. But once you can tap into that vein of who you really are for, then those students are like, Oh man, I've been looking everyone else. Their, their training seems like they were for everyone, but this is, is for me. I like drawing fairies, right. you know, like it's, right. it's only about fairies because, you know, I, I wouldn't have believed it if I didn't interview people, but p artists build business on fairy art and on yeah. dragon art. And so your website could be, and again, here's another business idea I would love someone to do how to draw dragons, just a whole site on dragons, be the, own that space, you know, go and do it and then show me how much bigger it is than my business and, and, yeah. and teach me something, you know, I would love for somebody to do that. No, it's true. I mean, there's this sort of, 
uh, dichotomy, I guess, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner of um, the fear is I'm not going to have any customers. So I offer a lot versus I'm going to be a niche, you know, market. I'm going to look at something very small and specific and then realize that that could explode. Right. I mean, I'm a perfect example of that. And I didn't write the books. When I wrote the books, there was no intention of it, of business. I just wrote them because I thought I was done teaching. I was, that's really how the book started. I was like, I'm done. I'm so burned out from teaching. I'm going to write a book and put this behind me and move on with my life. Wow. That's how it all started. Cause I was just so tired. You know, I was teaching, I had taught at that point for already like 10 or 12 years. And I was teaching like a hundred to 200 students a term. And it was my, it, that's all I was doing. Like I was just teaching and teaching and teaching and, it, and teaching is a very giving, um, career. You know, you're always like putting yourself out there and, uh, you know, I was just, I was burned out and, I never thought when I wrote that book that I'd be sitting here today, right, having com business conversations about uh, an internet, you know, website and what teaching is like online versus in the classroom. Um, but to get to your point, um, I think what's really surprised me, and I think probably one of the best things I, I did from a business standpoint is be that specific and say, like, I own this method called force, right? Like, it's so small. Right. And yet it's known worldwide now. Right. It's kind of weird. I mean, McDonald's is a great example. Right. Every entrepreneur, I'm sure, is read up on like McDonald's, you know, and it's just like amazing that, you know, that Croc actually in that case. Right. Like he found a, 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 a what do you call a, a, you know, a restaurant that was making burgers and what they did was systemize it. Right. And he was like, wow, that's really powerful. And it's just the simplicity of this little system of making hamburgers and fries is what exploded and now is, you know, worldwide, right? It's only one little thing. Now, McDonald's, to your, what you mentioned, it's interesting that they, they add stuff, right? They added like chicken McNuggets and they make like sandwiches and salads and they'll come up with like different drinks like every quarter or whatever, right? But really at the core of the business, it's still the burgers and fries, you know? And then they put this icing on the cake on the top of it. But the business is still really the basic stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I think, you know, if anyone's listening out there more from a business standpoint, I would, you know, even as an artist and you want to really sort of stake your claim as an artist, um, I know it feels like I just got to do everything so people see it. Um, but to what you were saying, Mitch, I, I think artists that stand out are the ones who actually have a very specific niche. You know, they do a thing. You know, my, my wife and I debate about this all the time because she's an illustrator and, uh, and she's been out of the market cause you know, she's been helping, um, bring up our children for like the last 15 years. Right. So she's like been out of it. And we have this debate all the time about like style and content. Right. And it's like, well, there are kind of two things, right? Like your style, if your style is really, 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 really clear and strong and unique and different, you can pretty much draw or paint anything because the style is holding it all together and it's so unique, right? It's so darn unique that that's the, that's the product, right? That an art director, let's say at a magazine or something is going to buy. Um, or is it the content, right? Is it like, you know, you just do dragons to your point, right? Like you draw dragons, maybe your style fluctuates a little bit in that space. You have a little more range, but the thing is just dragons. Well, then you, you know, you've landed on that. But imagine when you put both of those things together, which feels like the highest risk, which is I have a very specific style that I work in and I only do dragons. And if it's good, you know, if it's a good style, you're skilled and it's appealing that's when things really explode, right? Because it's this one particular thing. And I, I really have to say over my 20 something years experience, I think that's what people actually want. You know, it's like, I want to see something unique and different and yet really amazing. Right. And, and even if you did just dragons to your point, there's millions of people out there that are into fantasy, right? Like the audience is huge. The world is huge. So like almost no matter what you pick, you're going to have a massive audience. It's just that you have to be good at it, you know? I, I think you have to be really good at the thing that you do. So it kind of goes back to the cliche of like, you know, follow your bliss, right? Like follow your passion, do the thing you're really excited by and the rest will follow, but be really good at that thing, <laughs> you know?
Yeah. It, like for me, it blew my mind going to the local comic convention here. When I saw an artist, like I saw two people doing dragons and I talked to people on the podcast. But when I saw the artist who only did owls, that's where I was just like, yes. Like, and, and she was awesome. They were, they were photorealistic owls, but I, I, keep seeing students on this path where they're trying to master everything. Like someone put out this list of fundamentals and it's like, wow, I I know so many working professionals that they might be good at one or two or three of these things, or they might be like passable at all of the things, but very few people, what I say, master all of them. And, yeah. and the people that master all of the fundamentals are the artists that people are like, wow, you know, they, they speak about these artists as if they're, rock stars and they really are because they've mastered things i've worked with a few people with it they just do incredible things the most of the people that i worked with though they're just regular people who worked hard at their craft and you know continue to get better over time um yeah yeah i mean it's you know i think the challenge as artists that we have that and again this conversation that happens in this house all the time is um what works from a business standpoint doesn't work for most people right like i just talked about the the dragon and having a certain style and that's like now you're like very specific niche but as a human being um most individuals do not have the interest level to or commitment uh, or both to say i'm going to only draw dragons in my style for the next 15 years of my life for instance right <laughs> Right? Yeah, like, true. Right? Like, hundred percent true. Yeah, like you, as it just as a human being, you want to like grow and change, right? Uh, so, you know, all of a sudden, it's like only only very few people um, have that that um, uh, that laser focus, or you know, you can look at it as it a positive or negative, right? Either the laser focus of this is the thing I'm passionate about; it's, it's my life's passion. I'm going to do this for the rest of my life, and those people are. The people who are like world renowned artists, you know, they do this like one thing and they do it better than anybody else on the planet Earth does it, right? Um, like it, two names that come to mind when I think about that is like Brian Froud, right, who um, helped design like um, uh, the Dark Crystal characters and such, right, and his wife. Uh, they both work in um, like fantasy illustration and fairies and they, they really kind of own that space. Uh, and then another name that pops to mind is like Richard McDonald, who's one of my favorite sculptors. And he does these figures who really he's sculpting with like the way I try and draw with all this like fluidity and drama and, and the figure. And he's amazing. He's like amazing, amazing sculptor. You know, nobody can touch him. So but, you know, do you did you find that thing? Right. It's like and if you ha even if you have that thing, is that going to be a, a lifelong thing or not? You know, are you that passionate and committed about that particular thing. And I think that's what makes it hard for artists. Artists are usually not like that. Artists are actually usually the opposite. You know, it's like they kind of bounce around from thing to thing to thing to thing all the time versus saying, I'm just going to focus on this thing. I'm really excited and passionate about it. And I'm not, you know, I I'm just as guilty. I mean, I happen to love drawing the figure, fortunately. So that's been one of my commitments. But you know, I sometimes think about going into other, you know, other venues as well. And it's like, you know, you got to I think at some point you have to say, like, here's the thing that I'm good at. Here's the thing I'm really want to work on and become even better at or become the best at in the world um, instead of just, you know, bouncing around. But I, I get it. You know, I'm an artist. <laughs> like, I get it. Believe me, there's tons of things that people don't know about that I've wanted to do that I have on a list of, you know, on a whiteboard in my other studio. And uh I, I see that list every so often and I'm like, yeah, I just don't have the time for that thing right now. You know, I've got this other thing I'm, I'm working on, you know. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know where this is really going, but I guess what I'm, I'm getting at is uh, if, if your goal is to become world renowned. <laughs> right. I think the way to do that is pick what the content is and find your voice, you know, your style, find your voice and stick to it and become amazing at it. Like world renowned, you know, the best in the world at it. And you will get everything that comes along with that, you know, but do you have the commitment and passion or can you find that focus? It's almost like the same argument of people going to, you know, a lot of people go to school, right? And they can't declare a major, right? Because they don't know what they want to do, right? And that, that's most of the world. I, I think in some ways we're lucky as artists um, to say, you know, I've wanted to be an artist, you know? Um, so I happen to have that thing. Like I feel lucky in a way because I, I have two daughters and... 
One has always wanted to be a singer since she was like four years old. It's never changed. You know, now she's eight, she'll she be 18 in a couple of months. And I have a 15 year old who's really interested in like directing and acting. So I'm like, okay, thank God you guys know that I can help you with those roads. Right. But if they didn't know, that would be a lot tougher. You know, I mean, they would go through life, they'd go through high school, they'd get into college. But I think when you know, in a way, your life gets a lot easier because now you go, this is the thing I'm after. And then the world opens up when you know the thing. You know, it's actually, I think, more difficult when you don't know, you know. Does that make sense? Uh, it, it a thousand percent makes sense. And I think this is the the missing thing. And I get, this will be the last, I guess, points. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the last word, but this will be my last points here for this uh, episode. Sure. You know, there's – there was a story that I heard, and it might have been Warren Buffett who was speaking to an entrepreneur or something like that. But mm -hmm. uh, basically, the the person said, "I want to do so many things in my life," and and so the more experienced person said, "Okay, well, you know, let I'll help you with that. Let's make a list. Let's let's list out all the things that you want to do in your life." And I feel like you know, coming back to artists, that we want to do all these things. You want to make an animation and a comic book, and you want to do all this stuff. So list it all out. And then the experienced man said, said, okay, now what I want you to do is look at that list and think about the two things that you want to do the very most, more than anything else. If right. you could, uh, if you could do those two things, you'd be happy. Okay, great. You know, look at that list and there's maybe 20 things on the list and they narrow it down to two. It's like, these are the two. It's like, okay, great. Now what you have is a list of the things that you cannot do. So everything that wasn't on your list of two, you cannot do these things. <laughs> you must not do these things because right. they will distract you from accomplishing the two things that you said you most wanted to do in your life. And, you know, you can really only – if you want to achieve great things, I don't know if you can achieve a lot of great things in your life, to be honest. Yeah, right. Yes, there's some people that are they're amazing at everything that they do. But, but they're not the normal person. But right. as normal people, we can do ama like an amazing, life-changing, potentially world-changing uh, thing. Uh, and it, it doesn't even need to be so big. Right. But you have to focus. Yeah. And I think for me, knowing that I wanted to be a video game artist when I was seven, it, it just put everything into perspective. Either yeah. it led me – the thing I was doing either led me closer to working in video games or it didn't. And right. – if it didn't, well, then why would I do it? Unless it was fun, you know. Did, did playing baseball lead me closer to be being uh, getting a job in video games? Probably not, but it was fun, so I played baseball. Right. But yeah. did learning how to compose music help me get into video games? I think so because I didn't know how I was going to be in the video game industry. I could have been a, a musician. Right. I could have been a right. game designer, and in knowing how music works helped. Right. And so looking at things through that lens makes a lot of things come into focus. And, I, and even now with my life, I know exactly what I want to do, which is getting artists amazing results to create realistic art. And so either what I'm doing helps that or it doesn't and I don't right. do it and there's nothing else. And, right. and it, it's fantastic. So I feel like the next probably 10 years of my life is mapped out while I 100% focus on, on doing this thing. And um, fortunately, I'm in a position where I can put almost 100% focus. Uh, but even if you can't, you know, you can still take that that spare time, the the Netflix time, the YouTube time, the whatever time, and you can focus on something amazing for yourself. Yeah, you know, in listening to you, um, what kind of comes to mind is uh, when when I teach drawing, I think I talk about this idea of like the, the laser beam to the floodlight, right? So, you know, you're sitting there and you're drawing the model, and if you're a laser beam and you're focused. You know, you're going to actually learn more quickly where the floodlight is you're sitting there and you're drawing and you're thinking about lunch or the argument you had with a friend or whatever the night before um, or, you know, the concert you're going to go to this weekend, right? You're not really focused, but it comes down to this kind of thing as well, which is, you know, there's only so much time in each one of our lives, period. And uh, the more laser focused are, the faster you get to the places you want to go. Right. And I'm, I find I, I, I'm challenged by this as well. You know, like I feel like I'm always juggling usually about three to five things I would say, you know, and when I'm aware that I really need to speed one of them up, I need to drop the other ball, balls for a certain amount of time. Right. Cause that means 
I only have so much time and so much energy in a day. And if I buckle down on one thing versus five, that thing's going to go faster. Right. So at a simple high level abstract level, it's like, you know, the more laser beamed you are, the more focused you are, that thing is going to happen with more intensity and more quickly, right? Because more of your efforts going into it. And if you've got three or five things going, they could all happen, but it could take, it's going to take you three to five X longer to accomplish those goals. Right. So just be aware of that. You know, it's kind of like the Warren Buffett thing you said, you know, these other things in the end could just end up also into what you were saying in your story, the higher risk is they could just be distractors period to even getting those things done at all. Right. So imagine that. I mean, I know this sounds really corny, but I, I do think I have to say pretty often about, you know, when I'm, you know, when it's my time to go on this planet, am I going to be happy with what I accomplished? You know, it's like, am I really pleased with what I did here or not? Or am I going to have any kind of resentments or frustrations over things I didn't get done that I really wanted to get done? So that, that thought as morbid as it may be, that crosses my mind. You know, I'm like, are there still things I want to accomplish in this world that I haven't, you know, touched yet? And I'm aware that I'm interested in, or am I okay with what I'm doing? You know, and I don't know that drives, at least for me, that drives me, <laughs> you know? Yep. Yeah. Inevitable. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, so, you know, you only have so much time and the more you focus, the faster you go, right? It's like a race car, you know? You're going to really want to get somewhere quick, then focus on one thing. And as artists, it's really tough to do that because because um, we like to be creative, right, and learn lots of things and bounce around. But um, it takes you a lot longer to get anywhere when you're doing that, you know? Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, that's it. Thank you so much for – your insight and wisdom. I, I feel I could I could go for hours. I'm sure just Me just too. talking. Can we just continue and go? For, like you said, another 15 hours or so. Uh, but I'm sure I'll have you back on the podcast. And um, you know, if you're if you're listening and you're interested in doing figure drawing, uh, Michaela, who is the community manager inside Pencil Kings, the the young woman who helps all the beginner artists inside pencil kings and you know the more experienced artists mm -hmm. she loves mike's book and um that's she, good mike was was it was her recommendation to have mike on the podcast so uh very hearty endorsement from pencil kings to going go to check out drawingforce.com or looking up mike matese on you, you, amazon i'm guessing is the, probably yeah. the easiest place to yeah. to go and grab the book yeah, uh, and the book is Drawing with Force. What's the second most popular book? Because uh, um, yeah, there's, so there's to be brief. There's four. Um, there's an anniversary edition of the first book. It's an orange cover, and there's actually now a companion app with that book. So it actually launches 30 videos in the book, which is kind of cool. Um, and the other three, there's animal drawing book, and then there's like a character design book from Life Drawing, and then last but not least, there's an anatomy book that came out um, about a year ago, actually. Um, but second, it's hard to say. I know that the the definitely the best seller of them all is the first one, you know, which just had the 10th anniversary. That's the one that teaches the the foundation of the methodology. Uh, after that, I don't know. My guess is I think the anatomy book is actually doing really well, and then probably the animal drawing, you know. Character design, I think, is um, I think there's a lot of competition in that space that teaches character design in a more uh, expected way, I think, than how my book teaches it. So I don't know if that book does as well as I think the other ones, you know, and I, the irony is it's probably one of my favorite books of the four. <laughs> so go figure, <laughs> you know. All right. Well, thanks again, Mike, for hopping on the podcast. Sure. And uh, yeah, we'll be in touch soon. All right. Take care. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks for tuning in. Join us next week when we talk with the host of the Left Brain Artist podcast. She gives us some of the insights that she's gained from all of her interviews. If you want to see more from Pencil King's show, you can go to pencilkings.com slash show. Or if you're just looking to improve your art skills, you can always join us inside the private community at pencilkings.com. I'll see you next week. Ah, you talk like a fool. I would trade a century of practice for an ounce of inspiration.